the the index that uh, to the webinar that uh, we have prepared. Uh, as Maider said, um, we we are going to dive into the revolutionizing engineering design with the strategies for efficiency and sustainability. Um, this will be the index that I will follow. First, we'll see, um, we'll take an introduction to uh, what is design and how uh, how our components in engineering are designed. Then we will see a design paradigm change. Then we will explain uh, methodologies and tools on how to achieve it. And finally, uh, we, will we will present some success stories from our side. So first, I would like to come up with um, an object that um, all of us use uh, every day. Uh, those are the shoes. Shoes are um, mainly um, used uh, or designed for using it in a standard way. It doesn't matter the way you step, the activities you make with them. Um, it is even designed to be mass produced. It doesn't matter if it has to be recycled or not. So um, why don't we um, design shoes? customized to uh, or tailored for the user's uh, way of stepping or the activities they perform and also um, to be recyclable. Okay, we can come up with something like this, right? But why do we design the way we do right now? We should um, dive into the actual designing and production process in engineering. First, the first step in this uh, design process would be the problem definition, in which uh, you get the information, you gather all the information about the problem and you try to solve it. In the traditional um, designing process, uh, based on the designer's experience, uh, a solution is generated. This solution is then digitally uh, analyzed and evaluated and it is uh, a prototype is manufactured and uh, validated physically. But these last three stages uh, are uh, most of the times iterative in terms that uh, once you have, um, for example, presented a solution, if you simulate uh, the operation of that solution, it could happen that the design might change. Also could happen when a prototype is done and the test or the validation, physical validation is performed, something uh, with the simulation is not correlated. There we have another iteration. And finally, we also would have, for example, when a prototype in the manufacturing, for example, we have uh, defects uh, in the manufacturing process, it could, it could happen that uh, there is a problem in the design. So there we have another iteration. This will lead in the end to uh, select to the selection on implementation of the best solution to go in the end finally to the um, whole life cycle of the component and its end of life this has uh, different consequences for example our components right now are overdimensioned this means that we have more material or we have components with more material that it needs uh, we could have uh, components with less material and with uh, almost uh, the same performance or even be better performance. We also have time consuming uh, iterative processes, which lead to also uh, higher costs in production. We also have um, a lot of material waste in terms of as we have overdimensioned uh, products. But we also have uh, material waste because uh, of the uh, traditional uh, subtractive manufacturing methods. We could also say that we have more parts that we need because um, if we th think about a component, we could uh, lead this component to reduce, for example, the bolts and the nuts and join different parts together. And in the end, as the components that we design are not thought to be recycled or are not uh, uh, directed to be recycled, they end in the in a landfill as waste. As waste. So, uh, how can we 
um, or what we can do for changing our mindset and change our design process paradigm. So we could, for example, um, mimic what nature does. This, what you see in the screen right now, is uh, the life cycle of a tree. Everything starts with the seed. In the seed, uh, there is the information coded in the DNA of the, of the seed. In, the, in that DNA is coded the information on how the tree has to grow, which is the material quantity that the, the tree needs for growing and adapting to the environmental conditions. Uh, it is written also how it has to rep reproduce to create more trees and how this material will uh, contribute to the life cycle of the tree. So if we think of uh, an ideal uh, design and production process for engineering, we could come up with something like this. For example, we again gather all the information, we, uh, we check all the boundary conditions, all the things that are important for solving this problem, and we create a component DNA. In this component DNA, we will have some features that, we, that will be dependent one from each other. In terms, for example, we have material selection. Uh, we will select our components material, uh, material uh, not only because of the operability of the component, but also of the recyclability or, for example, the manufacturing process. We also will base our uh, design on the operational requirements, on the boundary conditions, for example. We will also have a cost analysis in this uh, ideal process, right? Then we, as mentioned, we will have the manufacturing process. We will take into account these uh, restrictions uh, like forced by the manufacturing process itself. Then we will analyze the, the end of life of, of the component to, be, to have these components more re recyclable. And we will have the adaptability, which can be achieved with a good maintenance and with a proper mechanisms of adaptability alongside the, uh, the, the whole life of the component. In the end, we'll have the evaluation and selection of the best uh, solutions and the implementation of it to go ahead to the end of life of the component. So uh, until now, we we would like to, to ask you a question. We'll make a poll. So uh, we'll be uh, thankful if you can uh, answer to this question. Okay, you are still answering, and the, the answer is not in the short term, but we still need some advancement. But you still believe that we can achieve this goal, so that's, that's a good sign. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going. So how do we achieve this or how we can achieve this? Uh, we can base our, um, let's say, success in two main pillars. The first one would be the advancement in computational power and tools, and also the improvement of materials and advanced manufacturing methods. Um, if we dive a bit into the, the, the computational uh, tools, uh, we, first see, for example, that uh, a very common um, engineering problem, which is structural optimization. Structural optimization can be divided into three different types. Uh, imagine that we have uh, a beam that we want to be optimized. For example, the first one would be the size optimization. In this way, we are just able to optimize the cross-section of, um, <clears throat> of this beam. For example, in the shape optimization, we are able to change the shape of this beam in order to achieve our uh, objective function. And in the end, the one that is most used in, in engineering right now 
is the topology optimization in which you can change shape, uh, size, and even make some holes inside the structure. But how does it work? Well, let's imagine that we have this cantilever beam in which we have a force applied in one of the of the ends, and we uh, discretized our geometry into 200 elements, for example. Let's say that we want to solve or we want to achieve the best um, the best geometry possible with just 60 blocks. Okay, so if we do the maths, we see here that we have almost, well, we have a lot of uh, possibilities to achieve this optimal geometry, right? If we think of doing it by hand and calculating each of the solutions by hand, it would be impossible, right? So uh, we have to define uh, the physics that would lead to the optimal geometry. In this case, we will make the analogy that each of our uh, elements is a spring. So the spring, we define the static equation of the spring and the elastic energy, which depends on the force that we apply, the um, stiffness factor and the uh, displacement. So if we change these uh, equations to the matricial form, we set the objective, which is one of the most common objectives in topology optimization. It's maximizing the stiffness, for example, or minimize elastic energy, which is almost the same. And we, for example, um, set a design variable uh, as element density, which would be one if that element will be solid or zero if it will be void. As volume constraint, we will set, uh, for example, the number of blocks. Uh, we said 60, well, the volume constraint will be 60. So in the right hand, in the in the bottom image, you will see to, mini, to uh, accomplish this objective function, which is the best geometry possible. But there are also a, a more um, computational tools and methodologies. For example, well, this is an example of topology optimization. In a, in a real case, but we have more uh, tools. For example, the by inspired design. Uh, by inspired design, uh, well, it's a very uh, broad concept, but <clears throat> uh, I'm talking about, <clears throat> about true beer inspiration, which involves intentionally mimicking natural forms that have evolved for a specific function to optim optimizing engineering components. How does it work? Like. Uh, you first have to do a research in nature and find which are the most similar solution uh, to your uh, component or to your problem uh, in terms of physics and try to apply those into your component. The problem here could be that maybe the scales uh, could not be accomplished in terms that, for example, if you uh, see um, a natural pattern that you want to uh, replicate into your component uh, that could work maybe in the micro scale, but if you are doing uh, to a macro scale uh, component, maybe it is not um, working uh, correctly. But also could happen again with the materials because uh, natural materials are not, for example, like metals. So that should be taken into account in by inspired design, in true by, by inspiration. Um, for example, one of the most typical examples here is the, the use of honeycombs in engineering uh, components, for example, in crossable structures. But again, we have also different um, or more uh, methodologies. For example, generative design, which is a very broad uh, concept that uh, we all see nowadays. Uh, many times we see that the the, the definition of this broad concept is uh, lead by the commercial tools that they sell the, the product, right? But I, I like to, um, to define a generative design as assess initiative set, which says a tool that uses algorithmic methods to generate feasible designs or outcomes for, from a set of performance objectives, performance constraints, and design space for a specific, a specified use cases. This uh, could resemble to topology optimization and is actually 
most of the generative design tools or commercial generative design tools are based in topology optimization, but they, but they also use, for example, cellular automata, genetic algorithms, or artificial intelligence to generate innovative solution. Um, it actually, generative design tries to advance topology optimization by including, for example, manufacturing methods, cost, or uh, safety constraints. But again, the influence of commercial tools is, uh, is huge in this, in this concept. This would be one of the most common uh, generative design examples. But we also have, for example, parametric design and field-driven design, which uh, in essence is a design approach where designs are defined by parameters and rules. Uh, these rules uh, allow uh, the manipulation of these outcomes. And if even if physical fields are included, uh, you, you are able to optimize your part uh, considering the, the distribution of these fields during the design phase. It can be used, for example, for lightweight structures uh, in automotive and, and aerospace uh, industries. It can be used also for different physics, like, for example, uh, thermal management uh, and electromagnetic components, for example. Here you see uh, uh, an example from Cinera, which uh, is a, a nozzle uh, which has been um, analyzed by an FEM analysis, and you have a field of uh, pressure stress distribution. You have some ribs, and the objective was to uh, optimize or set the thickness, each thickness of each rib, uh, depending on the uh, pressure stress field. So, also a very interesting methodology. We then will have uh, the cellular and lattice design. Uh, this is a design methodology that uses a structure with uh, repetitive cellular patterns. Uh, it can be used to optimize the component's performance and uh, reducing the material usage. Uh, it can uh, enhance the, the mechanical properties of, um, of the component, but also has uh, different uh, properties in different ph physics. For example, in thermal uh, management, acoustic and energy absorption capabilities, for example. It can be also complemented with field-driven design and parametric design in order to morph these cellular structures to achieve even uh, better results. This is an example that we have performed in Technalia. This is for uh, uh, thermal management example. Then I would like to uh, explain also the eco-design. Eco-design is a philosophy focused mainly on minimizing environmental impact throughout the product's life cycle. Um, it is important to have the or consider the life cycle in the design phase, uh, as we or we uh, one of our objectives is to reduce the environmental footprint. And well. Right now, the, uh, this philosophy has grown from a academic research to large commercial implementation. So it's, it is actually used in, in the industry. This should be an example of what you take into account when you um, apply the eco-design principles. So you have the input, you take the raw materials and the energy, and uh, with all the process uh, from the uh, manufacturing till the final disposal, you are able to measure the uh, waste and emissions uh, derived from, the, from this component uh, production. Finally, uh, we will have the design for manufacturing, which is a design approach focused mainly in reducing uh, the production cost, the effects the, or the defects of manufacturing and enhance the quality. How uh, it is performed? Well, you have to know uh, very, very well the manufacturing process that you are going to use for your component. So you are able in the design phase to um, morph your design to achieve uh, a good uh, manufacturing result. In this case, we have also our one of our examples where we had a first optimization of a, of a component and 
uh, when we selected the manufacturing method, we had to add some manufacturing restrictions to avoid those um, those manufacturing defects. Um, as an example of these uh, commercial tools that could enhance this uh, kind of um, or englobe all of these methodologies could be Cinera, which is a low code uh, a low code platform that uh, works with a different uh, computational aided uh, design manufacturing and engineering tools uh, and it helps to for example automate uh, automating the, the for example the, the workflows in every day's um, designers work uh, we have worked here with uh, with Cinera, for example uh, in different projects but now we are for example developing and adding for the software which uh, will help this design for manufacturing in terms of uh, casting design so if you want to check the, their, their information, you have their, their, their uh, credentials. Now, uh, I would like to, uh, to do another question to you uh, in the poll. So please uh, answer the question. Well, interesting answers again. So most of you occasionally um, use uh, optimization tools in exploratory phases, not in every day's workflow. Maybe in the next future it will change a bit, but yeah, it's very, very normal to use in exploratory phases. Okay, maybe we can proceed. So now that we have seen the, the computational tools, we would like to um, uh, explain some uh, additive uh, or advanced manufacturing methods. We'll have, for example, uh, to achieve or to manufacture these complex shapes. We'll have additive manufacturing, for example, which is uh, wide, widely known for uh, its flexibility for designing complex shapes. Um, one or the main inconvenience of these uh, methods is that they have a uh, high building time and limited uh, construction envelope but still uh, it is a very good uh, answer to to the complex shape manufacturing uh, we also have um, the casting process there are uh, different types of casting but so well some of them are able to uh, manufacture uh, complex shapes in a small amount of parts and some others are less flexible in the geometrical part but um, more flexible in the if, if you want to manufacture large amounts of parts and finally we'll have the classic machining or the milling the complex milling that could serve also to manufacture these complex structures but many times uh, in terms of material waste uh, is unassumable. If we see uh, more closely the additive manufacturing processes, we'll have binder jetting in which we can uh, reproduce like very small structures. We have powder bed fusion, uh, which is one of the most used uh, methods in the, in the industry. We have seed lamination and for example, direct energy deposition. In casting, as I was saying, we have uh, the expendable mold and the per permanent mold types. In the expendable mold, we'll have, for example, investment castings and casting, gravity casting, these kind of castings that allow us to, in a, in a small amount of parts, we are able to construct very complex shapes. But for example, in the other way, 
in the in the permanent mold, for example, in high pressure die casting, we are able to produce a large amount of parts, but with less flexibility in that geometrical part. And also we have the the milling that is able to to uh, to construct these these shapes. Um, now I would like to uh, introduce you the methodology that we use for our designs. Uh, we, of course, start gathering all the information of the problem. We define uh, as well as we can the boundary conditions that the product will uh, suffer during its life. And then we construct a component parameterization and optimization uh, with different um, uh, constructing blocks, let's say. We have material selection, we have operational requirements, we have the manufacturing process, so we take into account all this in the design phase. Then we usually uh, make research in nature and try to uh, extract some um, natural patterns from nature to apply them into our designs. And finally we also apply some eco design principles so our components are or have less uh, carbon footprint and in the end we go to the evaluation selection and implementation section uh, we this uh, i would like also to present you some of our capabilities we are able to uh, make prototypes with different processes. We are able to perform gravity casting, high pressure die casting, investment casting, and different types of additive manufacturing. Uh, we work mainly with metals, with aluminum alloys, steels, irons, but also we have uh, an ad hoc uh, material design uh, process, which is also uh, a very interesting phase to achieve the, the, that ideal designing process. Uh, now I would like you, or I would like to introduce some of our success stories. The first one would be this one, which is Biofly. Uh, this project was developed in a uh, European uh, project frame, Oasis. Uh, it is uh, based on the re redesigning and optimization of these columns that you can see here. Um, supporting a uh, wing structure um, the problem here is that the columns are like very specialized for their uh, um, usage and they have to be very aligned so the objective of this project was to um, make a normalized column that could um, support all the loads and support all the vibrational requirements which were uh, very strict uh, to be able to have just one um, assembly line in in these uh, aeronautical warehouses. Um, we performed a very extensive um, design uh, or designs outcomes different with the different methodologies as you can see in the center image. This would be the reference design and we achieved different solutions. But in the end, uh, we saw that uh, with the true bio inspiration of uh, dragonfly wings, uh, we achieved the best result for uh, occupying the vibrational requirements. Because we saw in literature that the dragonfly wings have, or the natural pattern of the dragonfly wings have a very good vibrational uh, um, behavior. So. In the end, we decided to manufacture this part. We used the process of additive manufacturing assisted gravity casting, and uh, the material was uh, aluminum silicon alloy. We finally uh, manufactured the part, as you can see in the bottom uh, image, and we also validated physically uh, accomplishing the results that we were expecting. So this was uh, a very successful uh, case. Then uh, I would like to present you another uh, example, which is 
uh, project Lobster, which also was developed in the frame of Oasis, uh, this um, component is a reaction wheel for satellites. Um, in, 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 in space applications, many of the problems are the, the vibrations during launching, but also as it is um, a component which has to suffer like very high uh, rotational speeds, we had a lot of um, um, stresses in, in that way. So we had like very um, strict, again, requirements for, for this component. We based our component design in the, um, the, the exoskeletons of uh, diatoms, which are an algae that can be found in the ocean. Uh, we uh, had uh, a lot of designs and the one that you see in the screen was the best solution. Um, we again manufactured the part with uh, additive manufacturing assisted centrifugal and gravity casting with also an aluminum silicium alloy and you can see the 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 mold here which is additive manufactured is a sun mold and the part produ as produced. Then it it, uh, it had to be uh, like uh, post-processed and in the end it was uh, tested in, in the uh, European Space Agency facilities in the Netherlands with uh, very good results. Then I would like to show you uh, another example which is from another industry. It's uh, an scaled wind turbine gear. Uh, uh, we got this project um, for developing or redesigning uh, gears in in this uh, industry. But as one of the objectives of the pro of the project was to manufacture the part with SLM additive manufacturing process, uh, we had to scale this um, this uh, component. We scaled not just the the component itself, but also the uh, boundary conditions. So we performed again uh, a parametric design solution. We uh, took the natural patterns from the diatoms again, and we performed uh, a lot of uh, different designs, as you can see in this uh, left image. And in the end, we achieved the best solution possible. We um, also validated uh, in terms of fatigue. Uh, so the component should. Um, support even to 1 million cycles. And finally, as a bonus track, I would like to uh, present you uh, a different type of, um, of optimization in which we have the challenge to have or to optimize a wing for a low speed aircraft. Uh, in this case, we perform first um, like um, a very thorough review of uh, airfoils in nature. So we, in the end, or well, we uh, performed a 2D analysis where we uh, had the best solution, um, the, um, the albatrosses uh, airfoil, but then we uh, translated that into a 3D um, simulation where we saw in, in some examples in literature that, the, for example, the, the tubercles or the, these protrusions that you can see in the whales, uh, in the humpback whales, uh, pectoral fins have a very good or have a positive effect in the aerodynamic um, um, performance of the, of the wings. So we try to apply it to our, um, Fluid, fluid dynamics regime and we obtained that the lift was uh, significantly increased. So this this was also an interesting uh, an interesting case. So to to end with this uh, with this presentation, I would like to do another question, which is. Um, this one
well, I can see that most of you uh, have selected the, the second answer, that it would be interesting to see the potential of this methodology. So, and the ones that definitely are interested in exploring this collaboration, you can uh, contact us in the in this uh, email um, in these emails. So, thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I would be glad to to answer. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Ignacio, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, before uh, moving on to the question section, uh, some reflections okay. come to my mind. Uh, I, I see the potential of this uh, new era of uh, component design, and even uh, the, the, the potential uh, the knowledge of materials and the capability of uh, improving in the manufacturing processes. So, a combination of uh, this uh, new, new design, design with the uh, knowledge of the materials and manufacturing processes, I, I see like a big opportunity to develop, to develop this uh, challenging new concepts, new projects, and new prototypes. Mm -hmm. to, to take into account, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the eco design uh, and the whole uh, cycle of the, mm -hmm. of the product. So, thank, thank you very much. much. It's very really interesting the, the, the approach. And uh, we now move on to the question section. And the first question, question we have is um, Are you planning to apply this methodology? to projects that deal with other areas of physics, such as thermal management or electromagnetic component analysis. Uh, please, Ignacio, if you... Yeah, for example, uh, as the last... Um, it was the last uh, example, the, the one with the wing, we are also working with different physics, not just structural optimization, but also, for example, CFD. And we also are currently working in different projects with thermal management, which is a very promising approach in for this kind of designing to achieve like very compact, for example, heat exchangers. Uh, but also we are planning to go further and go to, to for example, some electromagnetic uh, optimization. Also, yes. yes. I understand in this new era of electrification, I mean, new electric engines and mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, that's the, the, the requirement of this kind of uh, components uh, with these um, requirements of thermal management or, mm -hmm. or electromagnetic properties, yeah. uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, a demanding yeah. uh, area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let's continue. Uh, we have another question um, regarding you mention of incorporation incorporating eco design principles into your design methodology. Could you describe the specific principles or practices you employ? Yeah. So uh, for the eco design principles, we, for example, explore different uh, materials that we want to select. Um, we explore different manufacturing processes and we explore the, all the life cycle of the components, how, how it could be before starting to design. Uh, so we can have like a, a dashboard in which we know where, where is, for example, or which is the, the compromise or the trade-off between the, the best solution in terms of um, optimal uh, component and the best solution in terms also with, uh, for example, uh, carbon footprint of this uh, material and this manufacturing process. So, some of many many times we we use these principles as uh, a drive or I mean a principal driver in, in design phase. Okay, 
Thank you very much. I understand that here also all the capabilities of Technalia to, to develop these new advanced alloys is also a, mm -hmm. a good uh, opportunity to achieve these co-design principles from the beginning with this uh, DNA concept that yeah. you mentioned in the presentation. Yeah, for example, we uh, we explore the, um, for example, the, let's say, the raw materials, but also the recyclable materials. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, really interesting. Um, I don't know if we have uh, another question. Yes, here. Here. Uh, hello. Uh, curiosity. More or less, at what scale of piece, uh, piece sizes can the methodology, methodology be applied? Sorry. Well, it depends because, for example, uh, if we go. Sorry, uh, I, we see that we have problems with the audio, so we are going to repeat the, the question. Yeah. Yes. So the question was that more or less at what scale of piece size can the methodology be applied? Uh, we, was, we were saying that the, the methodology itself doesn't have this limitation. Uh, it's more about the limitation of the manufacturing process. So if we check the 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 examples that we have uh, presented before here the the biofly column for example had a uh, two meter high uh, we have the reaction wheel to be for example 300 millimeters of diameter and the uh, the gear to be 100 millimeter of diameter so the the scale is uh, is not very important in this case it could be important if we uh, don't know the scalability of the natural pattern, but uh, if the the physics of the pattern are known, if, that in this case are already proven, there should be no problem. There is another question. Uh, was another question asking if uh, these uh, components are already in the market? Mm -hmm. um, no at, this... no, at this stage, we all of these um, solutions are um, um, like demonstrators of uh, research projects. But uh, in the in the in the future, we will try to um, to get these products to the market. Okay, Ignacio, thank you again. I think that uh, it's really interesting and, and we can continue discussing and um, uh, trying to, to develop new concepts and new things and new prototypes in, in the future. Yes, there is another question. Uh, hello, could you speak to No, we have already answered all yeah. the questions. Thank you. Okay, so as I, I was mentioned, thank you very much again, Ignacio. Uh, I hope the audience uh, have enjoyed this amazing presentation. Um, 
And uh, I, I again thank all the attendees for joining us and hope you have learned and enjoy it. So this concludes the webinar and hope we will keep in touch to continue the discussions if needed or to collaborate in any interesting project. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions or something arises to your mind, you can uh, write us to our email addresses. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.